This video provides background and concepts for our hedging electricity course. So what is a hedge? Well, you're probably familiar with the green garden variety, but a few centuries ago, hedges were often used as barriers for protection. Now in the 16th and 17th century, that sort of evolved into the concept that some sort of a monetary risk could be ring fenced or surrounded figuratively by a hedge. For our purposes, the general definition of a hedge these days is anything that offsets a pre-existing risk. So what's the risk that we're worried about with electricity? It's typically the risk of some sort of a transaction at spot prices, either consumption paid at spot price by a consumer, for example, who's buying at spot price from a retailer, and that's surprisingly common, or purchases direct from the spot market. For example, a retailer or a large consumer Norska Scoob being an example. And the other type of spot transaction is spot revenue. So this is where a generator is either selling directly into the spot market or in the case of a small generator, they may be selling to a retailer and being paid the spot price. Now we typically talk about a hedge contract whose payout depends on the spot price at a specified node on the grid. And it often looks like this. A quantity times the strike price which is the fixed hedge price, minus the spot price. Now I just want to emphasize here that there's always a buyer and a seller with a hedge. And the hedge is there to reduce the volatility for both parties. So for example, if a generator sells a hedge to a purchaser, then the hedge is there to help reduce the volatility in sales revenue and to reduce the volatility in what the consumer pays for their spot electricity. Now the EA defines the hedge market for electricity as the market for the trading of wholesale electricity derivatives. And a derivative is a financial contract whose value, in other words its payout, depends on the value of other more basic underlying variables, typically a spot price in the electricity market. Now the participants in the hedge market are generators, retailers, gen tailors, small and large, larger electricity consumers, so either as a spot purchaser direct from the spot market or as the customer of a retailer buying at spot price, and these days financial intermediaries or traders. Now this last group are either buying or selling in one hedge market in order to sell or buy in another market, and the traders may be in there just to make money from trading in the hedges that are on offer. Now there's three different types of hedge markets that we're going to be looking at. The first is the over-the-counter market, OTC. Now these hedges are arranged directly between two parties to the hedge. It's largely unregulated and it's a bilateral market because there's always just two parties involved in the actual hedge contract. The second and a very important market these days is run by the Australian Securities Exchange. These are futures contracts available at the Otahuhu and Benmore nodes. This is very highly regulated by the Australian Securities and Investments Commission, ASIC, and to a lesser extent New Zealand's Financial Markets Authority, the FMA. And finally, the FTR market. FTR stands for Financial Transmission Right. Now this is actually covered by the code, so it's governed by the Electricity Authority. It's administered by EMS, the Division of Transpower, who's known as the FTR Manager, and the FTR market is cleared by NZX as the Clearing Manager for the spot market. Now legislation in New Zealand, the Financial Markets Conduct Act, which applied from December 15, limits who can buy or sell hedges. It says that trading in hedges is limited to wholesale investors or eligible investors. A wholesale investor is large, so this is investment businesses, government agencies, or just generally large entities who have net assets greater than 5 million or turnover greater than 5 million per annum. An eligible investor is someone who certifies they understand the risks and the consequences of taking those risks and that they have the skills and resources to deal in hedges. The other part of the regulation is that brokers and advisors, such as EnergyLink, must be registered accordingly under the Financial Services Providers Act and only work with wholesale and eligible investors in respect of electricity hedges. Now the basic structure of a hedge contract involves a couple of things. The first is some sort of exposure to spot prices. So over on the right hand side we've got a consumer, a generator or a retailer who's getting their physical supply of electricity at spot price or selling into the spot market or to a retailer at spot price. 
Now that party might also want to put in place one or more hedges with one or more parties. The hedges don't have to be with, for example, a retailer who's selling them electricity at spot price. They might be doing that with Mercury, for example. They might have hedged with Contact and Genesis. So one of the advantages of a hedge strategy is that you have much greater flexibility in who you hedge with. You also don't need to hedge to the tune of 100% of your exposure to spot prices. You might deliberately decide, for example, to operate at a 50% hedge level or an 80% hedge level. Those sort of scenarios are very common. Now, this arrangement in terms of numbers of parties is relatively uncommon. For the very large majority of consumers, for example, the default is to be on what's known as an FPVV contract. It stands for Fixed Price Variable Volume. So that type of contract is the sort of thing that you probably have at your household where you can consume anything you want in terms of kilowatt hours in a month and it's always at the same fixed price. Now we obviously want to enter into hedge contracts because of the possibility of volatility in spot prices. And this chart shows the average monthly price at Haywards by month of the year using data going right back to October 1996, which is the first year that the spot market actually operated. The black line is the average for each month. The blue line is the lowest monthly average price at Haywards. And then the red line is the highest monthly average price at Haywards. And the record there was set in June 2008 when the monthly average price exceeded $300 per megawatt hour. Now on the vertical axis, you can read that as volatility or risk. And we want to understand what creates this pattern of prices, particularly the top of the envelope where obviously the volatility is the highest. So to do that in a fairly simple manner, we first need to consider the pattern of demand, which usually peaks in July and also South Island inflows. Now the South Island is where most of the inflows and most of the hydro storage is. And that usually bottoms out in July with a peak in December. Demand across the country and South Island inflows are effectively out of phase. Now if we think about the probability of shortage as being a crude way of understanding what drives these extreme high prices in the periods of highest volatility, let's first look at the period from December through to March. Now in this period, demand bottoms out typically in December but it's starting to increase. At the same time, the South Island inflows are peaking or just passing their peak. So looking ahead, hydro generators assess an increasing probability of shortage. Now this continues through to June, where again, looking ahead, hydro generator would see demand peaking in July and also inflows bottoming out in July. But once you get to July itself, the hydro generator is looking ahead and seeing demand starting to fall, and they're also starting to see inflows pick up dramatically. So around about August, snow melt starts to cut in, and in September and October, the northwesterly storms that come across the Tasman start bringing lots of extra rain into the hydro lakes, and they start to fill up. So this pattern of volatility and risk that we see is entirely driven by interactions between demand and South Island inflows in particular. That's not to say that North Island inflows don't figure into it, but that interaction is a little more complex. On the subject of volatility, we as a company have run simulations where we take one year and run that year successively for in excess of 83 years. And we do this because we want to run a historical inflow data set, which goes back to April 1931, through an identical year over and over and over in order to isolate out the impact of hydrology and storage on prices. And that's what we're seeing in this graph. The red diamonds are the average price in each year. The dotted line shows the average over all 83 years worth of inflow data. And then the colored bands indicate plus one and minus one standard deviation, plus two, minus two, etc. And we can see that there are a couple of years where prices go very high and in fact get into the standard deviation. There's one year where prices are very low and go below the mean minus two standard deviations and one where it just reaches mean minus two standard deviations. And the first thing to observe from this is that prices are very volatile. They swing wildly from one year to the next in some cases. So let's arbitrarily define a dry year as one with an average annual price greater than one standard deviation above the mean and a wet year as one standard deviation below the mean. So on this definition, we have about 18% of dry years 
and 16% of wet years. And we also have a couple of years where the price gets to two standard deviations or slightly more in both the dry and the wet year cases. So we can see from this that the number of dry years and wet years is about the same. If we now look at the average number of years between dry and wet years, that's about 3.8, 3.9 in both cases. But there are some instances where we have two dry years in succession or two wet years in succession. In the other extreme, we've got a maximum of 14 years between dry years and 12 years between wet years. So yes, we could look at this and say dry years are slightly more common and more severe than wet years over the last 83 years, but really the differences aren't statistically significant. What we take from this is that predicting inflows is very difficult, if not impossible. Now based on data going back to 1974, we can trace the amount of energy generated each year by different types of fuel or from different energy sources. The blue is hydro, geothermal is in the orange and so on and so on, up to the red which is gas fire thermal generation. The green line shows the percentage of renewable generation which includes hydro, wind, geothermal, biomass etc. And that bottomed out in around about 2006 and since then it's been increasing and it's currently sitting around about 80%. And I guess in future the question is, well, how much higher does it go and when? Now this increasing proportion of renewable generation is very important from the risk management point of view and hence for hedging. Again, if we run one of our 80 plus years worth of simulations on an identical year, and we've done that using the base case from our price path, which has about 15% of thermal generation that's gas and coal fired right throughout and certainly by the time we get to 2026-27 which is the year we've used in this particular case study it's still around about 15% and then if we compare that to a case where we take out some of those thermal generators and make the percentage of renewables just under 90% now these are annual average prices at Haywards and what we can see is that the dry years are about the same price if not slightly higher in some cases but the wet years are a lot lower price. Now what that translates into are two things. First of all, an overall lower mean price, but secondly and more importantly for our hedging course is that the prices on an annual basis become a lot more volatile. So if we look ahead and assume that the percentage of renewables will increase, we can conclude that with more renewables we can probably expect prices to get more volatile, which makes hedging more important than ever. You'll often hear people talking about the forward curve or just the curve. The forward curve by definition is just a chart, a graph or a table showing the prices of hedge contracts that are actually trading. So in this example, they're the prices of futures contracts for electricity traded on the ASX back in May 2014. Also hear people talking about liquidity. A market is liquid by definition when trades can be made easily and readily. For example, we can ring up our futures broker and get them to do trades over the phone. The prices of those hedge contracts must be readily available to any person wanting to trade on that market. And the ASX puts futures prices up on their website as they trade with a 15 to 20 minute delay. And finally, and most importantly, individual trades must not significantly affect the forward curve or in particular the price of immediately subsequent trades. Now conversely, an illiquid market is usually characterised by large movements in prices after large trades, which makes it difficult to trade in the market at a predictable price. Now unfortunately, our hedge markets do tend to be relatively illiquid, at least compared to some of the larger financial hedging markets. And this occurs for a number of reasons, but two in particular. First of all, our big players in the market are primarily vertically integrated. In fact, the market as a whole is vertically integrated to around about 80%. And secondly, the TY smelter is the largest single load in the country. It's about 13% of the market. And at the moment, all of that is wrapped up in one hedge contract with Meridian Energy. So the smelter is not typically in the market looking for hedges. Now we'll try to minimise the jargon in the hedging course, but you will hear some terminology. First of all, the strike price already mentioned is the fixed settlement or hedge price. The hedge quantity is a notional quantity usually expressed in megawatt hours. A forward contract is a contract initiated at one time and performed at a later time. The price of the contract is typically set at the time the contract is initiated and payment and delivery in a physical contract, for example, would occur later. 
So all of the hedges that we're talking about and the futures are forward contracts. Another good example would be purchasing a house where you sign up for the house today and settle in six months time. The jargon sometimes is used such that people will refer to futures and forwards as if they're two different things. A futures contract is a type of forward contract. What they're really meaning are futures contracts as futures and forwards as certain types of contracts used for hedging, which just don't happen to be specifically futures contracts. The counterparty in a hedge contract is the other party. And finally, we'll be talking about the location factor in the hedging course, and that's the ratio of the spot price at one node to the spot price at a specified reference node. For example, the location factor of Haywards relative to Benmore is just the spot price at Haywards divided by the spot price at Benmore. A little bit more terminology around the hedge quantity. That must be in megawatt hours when we do our settlement calculations. However, hedges are often referred to in megawatts. For example, a two megawatt hedge. In this example, the quantity we would use in the settlement calculation for the payout in each trading period on the hedge would be two megawatts times a half hour or one megawatt hour per half hour. And finally, we'll be looking at types of hedge contract that are actually in use today to a greater or lesser extent. First, we'll look at contracts for differences, also known as CFDs or swaps. Now they have the form Q, which is a quantity in megawatt hours times the difference between F, the strike price, and S, the spot price. We'll look at futures contracts, We'll look at financial transmission rights, the FTRs. We'll look at option contracts, which do trade a small number each year. And we'll briefly mention a type of option contract known as a CAP, which the Electricity Authority is working with the ASX to introduce sometime in the near future. We'll mention reserve hedges briefly. There are other types of hedge one could imagine applying to electricity, but these five types of hedge are the ones that are actually traded. Mm -hmm.